Although calculus was not formally developed until the 17th century, the foundations of integral calculus were established by the Greeks nearly 2,000 years earlier. In order to compute areas and volumes of various shapes and solids, the Greeks used the method of exhaustion, which was developed in the late 5th century BC and made rigorous by Eudoxus in the early 4th century BC. The method of exhaustion used increasingly accurate approximations of areas and volumes and what is now known as a limit to find the exact values. In the 3rd century BC, Archimedes used the method of exhaustion to show that pi was between 223 over 71 and 22 sevenths by finding the perimeters of two 96-sided polygons, one inscribed and one circumscribed about a circle. In addition, he discovered that both the volumes and surface areas of a sphere and its circumscribed cylinder are in a ratio of 2 to 3 with similar techniques. Archimedes found this so amazing that he asked to have a sphere and circumscribed cylinder engraved in his tombstone. Two ancient Chinese mathematicians, Liu Hui and Zhu Chongzi, also used the method of exhaustion to approximate the value of pi, but much more accurately than Archimedes. In the 3rd century AD, Liu Hui developed an iterative method for using polygons to approximate the circumference of a circle, and used a 3072 gon to obtain the value of 3.1416 for pi. This was surpassed by Zhu Chongzi in the 5th century. He determined that pi was between 3.1415926 and 3.1415927, accurate to seven decimal places, and the most accurate approximation for nearly a thousand years. In order to get such a good estimate, Zhu must have used a 24,576-sided polygon in his approximation. Furthermore, he found the volume of a sphere, via Cavalieri's principle, over 1,100 years before Cavalieri was born. Unfortunately, much of Zhu's work was lost, so his exact method may never be known. However, he most likely found the volume in a way similar to this. Consider a hemisphere with radius r and a cylinder of radius and height r. Inside the cylinder is an upside-down cone with radius and height r. Note that at a given height h, the cross-sectional area of the region inside the cylinder and outside the cone is pi times r squared minus h squared. By the Pythagorean theorem, the cross-sectional area of the hemisphere at the same height is also pi times r squared minus h squared. Thus, the volumes of the two solids are equal. The volume of the cylinder minus that of the cone is two-thirds pi r cubed. The volume of the sphere is twice that of the hemisphere, which is just four-thirds pi r cubed. In the 12th century, the Indian mathematician Bhaskara made advancements in many of the fundamental principles of differential calculus as well as integral calculus to a lesser extent. However, it appears that Bhaskara did not realize the importance of his discoveries involving differentials and derivatives. His contributions include the following. Developing an early version of Rolle's theorem, showing that if x is approximately y, then sine y minus sine x is approximately the quantity of y minus x times cosine of y. In other words, the derivative of sine x is cosine x approximating the instantaneous velocity of a planet by finding the change in position over fractions of a second. About two centuries after Bhaskara, Madhava became one of the first to explore infinite series expansions for trigonometric functions. They include the series for sine, cosine, and arctangent. He also continued Bhaskara's work on differentiation and integration and investigated the problem of finding the area under a curve. At the beginning of the Renaissance, the intellectual movement was revived, and within that, the continued development of calculus. Descartes was one of the earliest Renaissance contributors. 
He changed the notion of geometry from a visual standpoint to one that was more algebraic, allowing later mathematicians to work with the functions of curves instead of the graphs. Cavalieri's approach to calculus was the method of indivisibles, when a line is made of infinitely many points, a plane infinitely many parallel lines, and so on. This is similar to the way arc length and integrals are taught in high school calculus courses. This idea set the stage for Leibniz and his explanation in terms of infinitesimals. While Cavalieri's calculations were accurate, he failed to prove many of his theorems, including the general form of the integral from 0 to a of x to the n dx, where n is a non-negative integer. Wallace later provided a proof for the integers 0 to 9, but stopped there and found no general proof. The proof presented by Norman Wildberger at the University of New South Wales is both simple and elegant, but took over 350 years to be found, despite its elementary foundation. The remarkable thing about this proof is the lack of any dependence on limits. Here it is. To prove that the integral from 0 to a of x to the n dx equals a to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, where n is a non-negative integer, first define a sub n as the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the n dx. By 5, the normalization property, a sub 0 equals 1. By the scale invariance property, integral x is equivalent to integral y. Using the linearity property, we can rewrite integral y as a to the n plus 1, capital A sub n. Using this and the additivity property, we write the quantity of 1 plus c to the n plus 1 minus 1 times a sub n. Then expand using the binomial theorem. Rewrite the integral by shifting it and then expanding it with the binomial theorem once again. Splitting the integral up and factoring out the constants, we get the following. This evaluates to this. This polynomial is in terms of c, so if we compare the first term of this polynomial and the earlier one, we note that c times a sub 0 equals n plus 1 times c times a sub n. The c's cancel, and we conclude that a sub n equals 1 over n plus 1. Combining this with our previous result for the integral from 0 to a of x to the n dx, we get that it equals a to the n plus 1 times 1 over n plus 1, which is what we wanted. The prior proof relies heavily on the binomial theorem, which is commonly credited to Pascal, but had been in use for centuries before. Nonetheless, Pascal made important contributions, including calculating the area under the curve of the cycloid using Cavallari's method of indivisibles. A cycloid is the path traced by a point on the unit circle that is rolling along the x-axis and looks something like this. Newton and Leibniz were the next major contributors to the study of calculus. Leibniz also came up with the current notation of derivatives dy over dx and the elongated Roman s for the integral. He had a different method of thinking about the integral than Newton, as he saw it as infinitely small rectangles being summed. Leibniz also saw the values of dy and dx as infinitely small increments. On the other hand, Newton saw differential calculus as the method of fluxons. He was less strict in his notation, and much of what he used faded quickly away. However, the fundamental theorem of calculus still remains today. He was the first to explicitly state it, although others had gotten close and even used it in a limited capacity. Both men are given credit for independently inventing calculus as they took different routes, Newton geometric and Leibniz algebraic. Following these remarkable discoveries by Newton and Leibniz was Roll in his theorem, which states that a horizontal tangent line will exist on the closed interval a to b if f of a equals f of b, which equals zero, and f of x is differentiable everywhere. After the development of Rolle's theorem, L'Hopital developed a method for evaluating indeterminate forms of limits. While the format has changed slightly from the original, the basic concept of differentiating the numerator and denominator of a ratio of two functions remains very much the same. Mathematicians were able to combine these many ideas into a cohesive new branch of math, thus revolutionizing physics, statistics, and numerous other subjects.